Now, a hearing on the progress of the 2000 census. Census Bureau Director Kenneth Pruitt met today with the House Government Reform Subcommittee. He talked about the progress of the population count and his agency's error in mailing letters to 120 million households, alerting people to forthcoming census questionnaires. The meeting with lawmakers was about two hours. Good afternoon. Uh, with form being present, the subcommittee will come to order and uh, we'll proceed. It's my understanding we may be having a vote around 2 o'clock or something, but uh, we'll just have to take a vote break <laughs> at that time. Um, good afternoon. Today we are here to examine the ongoing operations for the 2000 census. In our monthly public review of this process, once again, Dr. Pruitt, Director of the Census Bureau, is before us, and next week the GAO will come before the subcommittee as well. Since our last hearing, there have been several new developments that have not been positive. The Salvation Army has declined to let census enumerators into homeless shelters and soup kitchens. If there's any way that we and this subcommittee can assist you in this matter, Dr. Pruitt, or any similar matters, please let us know. There are also serious recruiting shortages across the country in a number of hard to enumerate areas. And we are aware of the very serious addressing error of approximately 120 million pre-notification letters. Also today, this subcommittee will address the lack of access to Census Bureau operations and information for the subcommittee and the General Accounting Office and the Census Monitoring Board. Just last week, I spoke with the GAO who complained of lack of access and delayed responses to information requests. The GAO made it clear to me that much of the information they request should be readily available to regional and local managers if they are truly getting the time and information they need to make daily decisions in the field. The Census Monitoring Board fights tooth and nail to get information it needs to conduct its oversight responsibilities. The Census Monitoring Board was set up under agreement with the President to assist Congress in its oversight duties. Employees of the Census Monitoring Board are Title 13 sworn and entitled to all information just as the subcommittee or the GAO is. Currently, the Census Monitoring Board has 30 outstanding requests for information with the Bureau. Director Perea, this is unacceptable. The experience of my own subcommittee has been troubling as well. Critical information, such as recruiting numbers or contact information, has not been provided in a timely manner. A recent request to the, obtain the Bureau's recruiting numbers took almost two weeks to be answered. Rather than just provide us the information we asked for, different delaying tactics seem to be used. In some cases, the subcommittee has even questioned, has, has, even the subcommittee has been questioned as to what we plan to do with this information. This turns the role of Congress and government agencies on its head. This is the people's census. This subcommittee has a right to any and all information we deem appropriate. While some of the Bureau may feel that oversight entities are a burden on the census process, you must understand that it is our legal responsibility to investigate, evaluate, and assess the hundreds of activities that involve the expenditure of $7 billion of public funds to carry out the constitutionally mandated decennial census. The combined resources of this subcommittee, the GAO, and the Census Monitoring Board is barely sufficient to oversee the massive undertaking of the Census Bureau. As you, as you have so accurately noted, this is the largest peacetime mobilization in our nation's history, with hundreds of thousands of workers and 520 local census offices. The combined resources of the subcommittee, the GAO, the Census Monitoring Board, and the Inspector General pale in comparison to the Bureau's massive operation. We're talking about roughly 42 people between the IG, the GAO, the Census Monitoring Board, and the subcommittee overseeing the 520 census offices, hundreds of ongoing census operations, more than 800,000 positions, and $7 billion in expenditures. By now, I'm sure you are aware of my concerns regarding the unprecedented stalls and delays in gaining access to basic information. I'm, I am requesting your help in breaking down these barriers so that we in Congress, the Census Monitoring Board, the GAO, and the IG may fulfill our responsibilities under the law and in an efficient and timely manner. Dr. Pruitt, you made a pledge that this would be a transparent census. Unfortunately, it has been rather opaque. In light of these access issues, I found it necessary to call a hearing specifically on the lack of proper access. This will be held on March 23rd at 2 p.m. I hope these access concerns are sufficiently resolved well beforehand. 
Last month's revelation of the addressing error made by Freedom Graphic Systems on the pre-notification letters is a serious matter. The Census Bureau has spent the better part of this decade developing its master address file. The heart of the census is a good address list because the bulk of enumeration is based on mail-out, mail-back responses. Now, this error doesn't appear to be contained within it in the MAF itself. However, the fact that the addresses were misprinted is still troubling. <coughs> Regardless of how good the MAF is, if the addressing is compromised anywhere along the process, it can still pose serious and, in some cases, crippling problems. This error underscores the serious need for aggressive oversight by the subcommittee. While I've publicly urged those receiving census forms to read them, no matter what address they may read on the envelope, and while the Postal Service has said it will deliver the letters to the correct addresses, I cannot share your determination that this error is cosmetic and not operational. I don't believe that anyone knows if, it is a, if a misaddressed envelope sent to a resident is less likely to be read than it otherwise would have been. The importance of the pre-notification letters to the hard to enumerate communities, especially those not speaking English, is high. The pre-notification letter also allows those speaking one of five other languages besides English to choose that language for the census questionnaire to be mailed soon. Unfortunately, there may be another problem emerging from this mailing list. The Washington Times and other newspapers are reporting today that it now seems that those who speak only English are confused by the lack of explanations for the mailing and the return envelope inside. The subcommittee understood that these mailings had been fully tested in focus groups. The subcommittee would certainly want to see the focus group testing results to understand how this mailing was developed. In light of these concerns, the subcommittee will be investigating this matter fully. We are enlisting the support of the Commerce Department's Inspector General as well as the General Accounting Office. This error also, once again, casts doubt on the ability of the Census Bureau to carry out one of the most complicated statistical experiments ever, better known as ACE. I would like to publicly thank the United States Postal Service. The Postal Service has really stepped up to the plate to help the Census Bureau and, in fact, America by making a pledge to deliver the misaddressed letters in the proper households. Dr. Pruitt, we all know hiring is so critical to a successful census. You note that nationally the hiring is going according to schedule. However, when one looks at the local hiring locally, a different picture emerges. In recent weeks, the subcommittee staff has visited local census offices that are having severe hiring problems in San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the Salt River Indian community outside of Phoenix. Similar problems were found in, by the monitoring board in New York City. To be fair, these visits also found local census offices that were ahead of schedule in Long Beach and Tequila, Washington. However, it is the ones behind schedule that have us concerned. Here in D.C., the recent stories in both the Washington Times and Post have highlighted local hiring shortages. In fact, recent news reports have caused Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton to call for an emergency meeting among local officials to solve this problem. An emergency job summit will be held, held later this month, and I applaud Ms. Norton on her quick action. I'm not totally convinced that the Bureau has a handle on this hiring problem. Looking at hiring nationally does not give one a true sense of where we stand. I hope you can shed some light on these important local hiring issues. Many of these communities are hard to locate and count. Again, Dr. Pruitt, thank you for coming for the subcommittee, and we look forward to the opportunity to ask some questions. Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome again, Dr. Pruitt. As, as the Census Bureau begins the most intensive operations of the 2000 Census, Congress and the American public need to stay informed on the progress of the largest peacetime mobilization in American history. I'm happy to say from reading your testimony, Dr. Pruitt, it appears that the 2000 Census operations are on schedule and as of today, there are no major problems. A year ago, many prophets of doom questioned the likely success of the 2000 census. While we're far from done, I think we can all take pride in the excellent work of the career professionals at the Census Bureau in successfully meeting the major milestones to date. Dr. Pruitt, some might have scoffed if you had appeared before this committee a year ago and predicted that today the Census Bureau would have all 520 local census offices up and running, fully equipped with computers and telecommunications installed and totally operational. That the master's address file of 120 million addresses, which may be the most complete 
ever due to improved processes, including LUCA and new construction programs, would be completed and in use. That one of my favorite initiatives, the Census in the Schools programs, would have exceeded its original goals and sent out over 1.3 million teaching kits to schools around the nation. That the Telephone Questionnaire Assistance Centers would be open, running, and fully operational. That the data capture centers and the software they use would be tested and already processing forms. That, que that questionnaires would already be delivered to rural areas. That questionnaires would already be filed through the internet. That over 90,000 partnerships between the census and cities, towns, businesses, and churches would be up and running. That the highly acclaimed paid advertising campaign would now be going into full gear. In the interest of time, I won't keep going through all of the, the list of initiatives that your, that your office has put into place, but I do want to mention my new favorite census promotional tool, the census promotional tour bus that is on the road and educating people. I spent uh, a day riding around uh, my region on the bus, talking to people. I think it's absolutely excellent tool. I wish we had more of them in our, in our areas, our regionals across the country. I think they're very, very effective. I, I, I am uh, sure there are some, even in this room, who would have, well, let us be polite, uh, questioned you for being overly optimistic. More importantly, even a few months ago, if you would have told this committee that recruiting would be above target and going well, I can only imagine what some would have said. While there are places in the country that have recruiting problems, on a national level, recruiting is above target. Given the Clinton-Gore prosperity, our nation is currently experiencing with its historically low unemployment levels, the success of the Bureau's recruiting efforts is all the more remarkable. I don't want to imply that things are perfect because there's still a great deal of work that needs to be done and we know there will be problems. The recent mishap with the addressing of the notification letter is an example. I would like to mention that I did receive my letter. I have it right here. It came um, over the weekend. So it came to my home and it was delivered. I am uh, pleased that the, the post office reports that there have been no operational problems with this mailing and they should be commended for the extra effort <coughs> taken to ensure that all 120 million letters arrived on time. <coughs> but on the whole, we're in good shape as, as one uh, could hope given our recent history. And given the fact that the Census Bureau had to revamp its program only last year, integrate over $1.6 billion worth of additional effort as a result of litigation by the opponents <coughs> of modern statistical methods. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> In fact, I would say that one reason the census is on track as of today <coughs> is because many of us in Congress and President Clinton resisted the efforts of some to micromanage the census <coughs> and left that up to the professionals in the census department. I would only uh, hope that as we proceed and problems develop that we can keep all the people looking over your shoulder, <coughs> this committee, the monitoring board, the GAO, the IG, the National Academy of Sciences, and the advisory groups, that we can keep them over your shoulder and out of your lap so that you can do your job without being disrupted. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I know you share my concern that we cannot harm the census with overzealous oversight. While we should conduct oversight, we cannot afford to do so in such an overpowering way that the staff of the Census Bureau cannot get their job done. <coughs> and in talking about oversight, I'd like to really put in the record uh, Mr. the co-chair of the Census Monitoring Board, Mr. Blackwell's um, letter, 
which he carbon copied to many people, but he left uh, me out, in which he notes uh, 31 areas, centers that he wants to see. Uh, I'd like that in the record along uh, with my, my comments. Again, as we proceed, there will be problems, big and small, but I would remind everyone that this is a massive, complicated process. I read in today's Washington Post, and they have, a, they have an article here, a small article, that a few hundred people out of the 120 million contacted complained they were confused about the postage paid envelope included. Well, for those who know that, that, that what they're reading, and, and that story is good news, that 3,300,000 3, 3, envelopes were returned from people requesting language forms on the first day. In America, to have a few hundred people call and complain about a mailing to 120 million people is pretty good, especially if it guarantees Americans with limited English skills can respond to the census. As I said, Mr. Chairman, I am happy to learn that the timetables and tasks for the 2000 census are currently on track. I look forward to hearing the details of the many census operations from our witness, uh, Director Pruitt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Pruitt, I believe uh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Raines will possibly stand with you and get sworn in, so in case they're needed to uh, participate uh, in response, uh, if you'd raise your right hand, say, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. The record uh, identify that all three answer in the affirmative. And uh, Dr. Pruitt, your opening statement. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have an opening statement. I'll try to go through it quickly. I might say that it does not address the issues raised in your opening statement. Instead, it addresses the issues that are, of course, in the invitation letter. Um, I would hope that before the hearing is completed, I will have a chance to address the issues you raise in your opening statement. That's fine. Thank you. Um, well, let me start by identifying the major operations and preparations for Census 2000 that have been successfully completed so far. Uh, to reiterate some of the things that uh, Congresswoman Maloney just mentioned. The master address file of 120 million addresses uh, is, of course, complete and we think quite accurate. Our field network of 12 regional offices and 520 census offices, local offices are open and are hard at work. We printed 85 different census forms, which will go to the addresses on our address file, and uh, developed and implemented our ambitious paid advertising campaign and signed up 90,000 partners. Did all of this happen without a glitch? No. Of course not. There were endless issues, large and small, that had to be resolved. The census is a vast, multi-part, rapidly moving system involving hundreds of operations and hundreds of thousands of temporary employees. On a daily basis, we have to deal with problems such as a fire in one and flood in another of our local census offices, the need to develop special procedures for handling the temporarily displaced persons uh, from the North Carolina flood, uh, to deal with the issue that you addressed in your own opening comments, the uh, Salvation Army uh, response to our attempt to count uh, in their soup kitchens, uh, backlogs caused by a higher than expected demand for census in the schools, two separate bomb threats in a local census office, a misspelling on a poster, public confusion among some English-speaking residents about the lack of instruction in the advance letter. Uh, indeed, another small issue that's come up, and I want to thank you and Mrs. Maloney for your statements concerning this, was the recent mailing that appeared to mimic an official census form, but in fact was simply a fundraising device. We were very concerned that deceptive mailings could reduce mail response by sowing confusion about what is or is not an official census form. The point is, we have successful, successfully are in the process of successfully dealing with each of these issues, and the list is far from exhaustive. New ones will take their place tomorrow, and the next day, and every day until the census is completed. While such issues require attention and resources, while they can be frustrating, while they often generate news stories we then try to correct, they are not of a nature to put the census at risk. Such an issue could raise, arise, but to date, it has not. Indeed, the most significant issue to date has been the addressing error on the advance letter, but as we all know, it was not of a character that put the census at risk. And I will address in more detail, of course, the issue of the advance letter in, in question and answer period, if you wish. Um, I should say that all of our indications are that the advance letter is being correctly mailed and indeed is being read 
I'll give you one indicator of that, sir. The advanced letter has a, a website address, uh, which is a, a job, job website address. Prior to the mailing of the advanced letter, we were running about 100,000 hits a day to that website. Uh, the last yesterday, or the day before yesterday, last time I was able to get the data, one million hits on that website. One million hits. So that's a multiple of 10. So that suggests to me people are reading the letter and responding to it. And as the Congresswoman just said, we're already getting a flow of requests for our language forms. We have taken additional steps in our advertising campaign with our community partners and through the media to stress the importance of the advance letter. We've done this because we do stress its importance, particularly because of the, uh, the fact that it is the vehicle for getting a language form, but also because it uh, is a way to uh, address the job issue and it's a way to quite increase in awareness, although I uh, can say that awareness right now is very high about the census. Um, the point is that when I last testified to you, I pledged to you that I would bring to your attention any problems in the implementation of Census 2000 that in my judgment could put the census at risk. After that testimony, I subsequently advised you by letter of the several categories in which a serious or systemic problem could occur in the current time frame, that is between that testimony and today. Uh, in that letter, I identified the fact that we had to launch our update leave operation and that if we were unsuccessful in launching that, that would be serious. I addressed the fact of possible problems with our payroll system, our problems filling our enumerator positions, our address file problem that would prevent our employees from being able to fulfill their responsibilities, our breakdown of the telephone questionnaire assistance operation. All of those operations have been launched on schedule and successfully. Doesn't mean something won't happen tomorrow, but as of today, there is simply nothing going on in the census operations that puts the census itself at risk. I want to add to that list because a lot of new things are going to happen between now and the next testimony. Uh, and I now refer to the March 29th testimony when I am scheduled to testify before a different committee, that is the House Appropriations Subcommittee, of which you are a member, of course, Mr. Chairman. By March 29th, we expect to complete the update leave operation, mail out the questionnaires in the mail-out, mail-back areas, begin the data capture process, start the enumeration of special populations, and begin reporting to the nation the mail-back response rate as part of our 90 plus 5 campaign. Major problems could develop during this period including breakdowns in data capture systems or in questionnaire delivery, unexpectedly low mail response rates, any event that could undermine faith in the confidentiality of the data, such as a hacker on our internet set, or a failure to meet our promise to provide the mail back response rate to the public. I don't anticipate those happening, but I want to put them on the record as the categories of things that I would quickly get to your attention if we begin to experience serious problems. So I today renew my pledge to keep you informed should major census-threatening problems develop in these areas or any other. Not anticipating such problems, I expect that our scheduled hearings will keep you apprised of any potential changes needed to ensure that Census 2000 data are of the highest quality. Uh, I will, uh, you specifically ask, of course, about a num number of operations. I will try to cover those quickly. Uh, you ask about the status of Census 2000 operational timeline and readiness for key activities. As I've mentioned already, we began the update leave operation on March 3rd as planned. We're running today slightly ahead of schedule in terms of getting the update leave questionnaires out. Since enumerators are leaving questionnaires at approximately 24 million housing units in areas, including Puerto Rico, that have several different address types. Telephone questionnaire assistance centers also began on March 3rd and will run through June 8th with six toll-free telephone numbers in English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Tagalog where people can call to get assistance in filling out their questionnaires, get replacement questionnaires, get language assistance guides, or provide their census questionnaire information over the phone. Indeed, we have already recorded 500 short forms over the, over the telephone system. Um, the questionnaire assistance center is up and running. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't have a problem with it tomorrow, but as of today, uh, I am confident that, uh, that we are able to handle the, uh, the, the flow of telephone calls. Um, We've also um, uh, identified 27,000 sites for our questionnaire assistance center operations. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, uh, we haven't mailed the, the advance letter. Uh, and in five days, indeed, sometimes the post office gets a bit ahead of us, so I'm already getting reports that some forms are out. But in five days from now, from March 13th through March 15th, the Postal Service will deliver questionnaires to some 98 million addresses in the mail-out, mail-back areas. These questionnaires are all at the postal delivery centers and are ready to be delivered. Also beginning March 13th and continuing through March and April, census enumerators will visit about a half a million housing units in our list enumerate areas 
and an operation similar to that initiated in Alaska on January 19th. These are the remote sparsely populated areas where it's not efficient to compile a pre-census address list. And then on March 20th, we will mail out a reminder card to those housing units we are asking to return a form by mail. Many will have already mailed back their form, but this reminder card will spur, spur others to do so as soon as possible. So those are some of the things that are, that are uh, already uh, in place and then some things that we anticipate in the next several weeks, all of which are reasonably large categories of, of things. And I want to put those things in one pile and the kinds of other problems we deal with every day, all day long, in a separate pile. And they're simply different kinds of things. Uh, and we are dealing with the small issues as best we can as we go. They're the ones that stir the, the press reports, but uh, they, are not, they are not of the sort that is putting the census at risk. You ask in your letter of invitation about the status of hiring um, goals. Hiring continues to progress well. All hiring goals for the update leave operation have been met. That is, we now have 73,000 people out there doing the job. Our goal is to have a qualified applicant pool of 2.4 million individuals. And as of today, or as of Friday, when we collected these data, we've recruited over 1.8 million qualified applicants. 74% of those who are needed, and slightly ahead of our goal for March 1, which is 70%. Of course, not every office is at target, and for these, we take special steps. These steps range in intensity based upon where a local census office is in relation to the goal. If an office is below but near the goal, for example, we increase the recruiting staff, distribute flyers, use targeted postcard mailings, or seek help from our partners. If an office is at less than 75% of the goal, we intensify the activities, including things like neighborhood blitzes, making special appeals to community-based organizations, and bringing in outside expertise with respect to recruitment. As a last resort, we're prepared to raise wages to assure an adequate pool of workers. Of course, we concentrate these efforts depending upon the task at hand, and thus first made certain that the local census offices with heavy update leave operations had sufficient staff. They did and do in every case. Now, of course, our attention turns to non-response follow-up due to start April 19th. Given the time available, the fact that we are front-loading and the capacity to take extraordinary steps if necessary, being able to staff the census operations is not what is currently keeping me awake at night. Other things are, but that is not. The status of data capture systems uh, you ask us to address, including the recent test results and the subsequent, migra subsequent migration to the two-pass system. The Census Bureau recently completed the final operations test and dry run according to plan in a pre-production operation test at all four sites. During the operations test and dry run in two of our sites, we learned that key data required for many write-in items and some checkbox uh, entries was taking longer than originally estimated. Based on these test results, we have implemented a two-pass processing system. In the first pass, we will capture the 100% data that is asked of everyone and some of which is necessary to provide the constitutionally mandated apportionment numbers to the president. In the second pass, we will capture the sample data from the long forms. This approach ensures that we will meet all processing deadlines and provides us with some staffing contingency. The decision has no impact on the schedule for the release of information for apportionment and redistricting and only minimal impact on the release of sample data. During the four test site, four test, excuse me, four site test, Staff introduced and successfully tested the first pass of the two-pass software for the 100% data items, and we're developing the testing schedule for the second pass. You ask about any difficulties in confronting local or regional census offices. All local census offices and regional offices are functioning. That was my report 10 minutes ago. There could have been a fire in the last 10 minutes. There could have been a flood. You don't know. 520 is a large number of entities. Something happens to one of them almost every day. But as of right now, they're all up and functioning. Um, and uh, we are working closely with GAO where we have specific problems like the, the, the water problem in a New York City office. Uh, but the, the key thing is they are there, they all have their telephone installations, uh, and they are handing calls uh, on, on schedule. Preparation and issues concerning Internet response to Census 2000 short form questionnaires. Internet, Internet data collection and questionnaire assistance began on March 3rd. For the first time, the Census Bureau is providing questionnaire assistance over the Internet and the option of answering the short form questionnaire via the internet. The questionnaire assistance effort provides on online help to respondents who need help in completing either a traditional paper questionnaire or the web-based internet short form, as well as providing answers to frequently asked questions about Census 2000. A 
Of course, the Internet Data Collection option allows respondents to answer an English language version of the short form questionnaire over a special secure Internet website if they can provide a valid housing unit identification number from the paper questionnaire. Indeed, using the barcode from my correctly delivered advance letter, I completed my form the other night in less than three minutes on the Internet. Internet data collection will operate until April 15, 2000, and the questionnaire assistance part of Internet will end the first week of June. You ask about the status of and issues concerning questionnaire assistance centers and be counted questionnaire uh, sites. Our partnership staff are working with community groups, business leaders, and local government officials to identify be counted sites appropriate to each community. Staff have confirmed over 15,000 sites. At these locations, which will operate from March 31 to April 11th, people who believe they did not receive a census form believe they were not included on a census questionnaire returned by their household or have no, un no usual address on census day will be able to pick up a be counted questionnaire. Staff have also identified over 27,000 questionnaire assistance centers, which will operate from today through mid-April and will provide assistance to individuals who might have difficulty completing the questionnaire because of language or other barriers. Sites include, but are not limited to, community and civic centers, banks, libraries, schools, grocery stores, health centers, and places of worship. Uh, we have selected and trained paid clerks, and we are seeking additional volunteers. We use our paid clerks based on their ability to provide appropriate language or literacy assistance in communities that need this type of support. All individuals providing assistance at questionnaire assistance centers, whether paid or volunteer, have been sworn to protect the confidentiality of individual information on the questionnaires. The Census Bureau is selecting and training staff to serve as be counted clerks in the local census offices. These clerks will conduct advanced visits to all sites to ensure their suitability, set up the sites, resupply forms as necessary, and close down the sites at the end of the operation. Unlike questionnaire assistance centers, the be counted sites are not staffed. They simply are places where people can pick up a form and mail it back. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, I repeat at this point, 24 days from Census Day, I'm aware of no serious problem that would put the census at risk. The next month is crucial. I cannot promise you that serious problems will not occur. I can only promise to keep you informed. Timing was just right. Thank you, sir. I'm trying to decide what the bells are. We're going to go in recess, I hope. 24 days of census today. OK, we're going in a recess until 2 o'clock. So okay. um, uh, let me, um, you know, your statement just outlines how complex and huge an undertaking the uh, decennial census is. And it's impressive that you and the people at the Census Bureau are able to pull it all together as we get close to uh, the official census date. Um, but to begin with, and I mentioned in my opening statement this question of access. This has been a concern and problem from day one since I got involved over two years ago with the formation of this committee. And we've talked about it. I brought it up last week in appropriations with uh, Secretary Daly. Uh, <coughs> and as we begin to approach some very critical parts of the whole census over these next several months, um, I think we need to make sure we have complete access to the information that's needed to do what is lawfully required of our oversight responsibilities. And we're talking about $7 billion of taxpayers' money, and something that obviously has the major impact on this whole country for the next decade. And I come from the private sector. I was never in government before. I, I, I an ally, uh, use the analogy sometimes of being the auditor. Uh, and I see th these reports coming out of here on guidelines that the Bureau is giving us. And to me, if I was a private auditor and doing this in the private sector, I would quit the job. It would not be even acceptable. It would be totally unacceptable under any CPA guidelines to do that. And, the, and I think it's almost arrogant the way this is written because it's telling us and the other oversight agencies of government, which includes the Inspector General, and I haven't really talked directly with the Inspector General's office, the uh, <coughs> Census Monitoring Board, the General Accounting Office, what we can and can't do, and I thought, we're the elected representatives of government. And I know you're appointed by the president, but we do have legal responsibility for oversight. And we also, because of the $7 billion, have a responsibility to see that. The monitoring board was created in cooperation with the president to have the responsibility. And we're, you know, you're, we're talking about, I think they told up maybe 40-some people total with all these four agencies that are going to be involved in the census issue. And we're talking about 520 offices and hundreds of thousands of employees of the Bureau. 
And so I'm concerned about the access. I am concerned that over the past year or so, the delay in tactics that have been used, and I know there are Commerce Department political operatives that kind of hold things up, but we always get different excuses. And this can't continue. And when we get into the critical time of the summer, uh, it's going to be important that we have access. And let me tell you, give you one illustration. Uh, you know, one of the people talk about is that there's, and I don't believe this is true, but I'm, I'm saying this comes out, is that, you know, there's going to be an interest in not being successful with the full enumeration, so we have to use adjustments. I don't think that's, I mean, I think you're, you're too professional, and so is the Bureau. But there is those that say that they're going to not do a very good job of enumeration. We have to do uh, an adjusted census. And uh, uh, the problem is, when you get to close out, for example, on close out, you know, and GAO raised this issue, that you're going to do close out, instead of using, I think it was 16 weeks in 1990, you're going to do it in 10 weeks, and you're going to have an extra uh, 10 million people to do it. Well, you can close out in 10 weeks, just, you know, quality of data, maybe that, not that good, and you know, the, you know, I didn't know that. And so the question is, as oversight responsibility, we want to make sure, for example, that when we do close out, it's being done right. Now, if we have to give two weeks' notice in every case because you require it, how can we do the oversight? Should we just say, trust you with $7 billion? Well, I'm concerned enough about it. The General Accounting Office has spoken to me about it. The person, in fact, who's going to be testifying next week will, will raise the question. He's never had this type of experience in his 17 years at the, uh, uh, in the General Accounting Office. I think we need to have it clarified what we can and can't do. We certainly don't want to interfere with what's operating. But some of these, you know, for example, you have to have a regional director or, a C or an assistant regional census manager accompanying anybody that shows up at an office. My gosh, you're going to waste everybody's valuable time when someone wants to stop in to see. I, um, I think you've uh, created a bureaucratic m mess with these rules and regulations. I think uh, you, you should be open. If you want to be transparent, you need to make it available. And I, I, I'm, uh, you, know, you start running, are we trying to hide something? Are you, you know, we don't want you to see that. And sometimes information, we don't, it takes us weeks to get information. So uh, but we're going to have a hearing on it in a couple of weeks. I would also like to recommend that you or someone senior in the, uh, on the decennial census have a meeting with all four agencies involved, which would be the monitoring board, the inspector general, and make sure that we all understand, and maybe this can be worked out. But right now, I've got serious concerns that's been created. Now we can respond. Thank you. Uh, could the, the, the closeout processes, for the moment, I'd like to address those, but I will not make those direct. Let's talk first about the I'm just using that as an old Exactly. Yeah. But let's talk first about it. Because I'm, I only mention that because some of the facts you used about 1990 were not exactly correct, and I would like to put, make the record uh, worse. Um, but I'd like to address the address the uh, access issue as best I can in a few moments. Um, uh, since I became director uh, in, in late October, uh, there have been approximately uh, 10, depending on how you count, 10 or so major GAO reports. Um, and I have to have most of them here with me. Um, in not a single one of those reports, Chairman Miller, is there any expression of concern about the cooperation of the Census Bureau? It's never been, a, it's never been put, in, put in a report. Indeed, following what uh, uh, many experienced is perhaps the most intense and detailed investigation of the Census Bureau in its history in August of last year, when we're in the middle of trying to put our operations together. As you know, I had to write you about it. I was so concerned about the amount of time it was taking of our senior management. Um, and that if the GAO investigation continued at that level, uh, it could indeed put the census at risk. But speaking of cooperation, let me read you a sentence from that report. We provided a draft of this report to the Department of Commerce for comment. As requested, the, as requested, the director of the Bureau of the Census provided written comments on behalf of the department in two days. This was a thick report. We appreciate the Bureau's rapid response to the draft and its overall cooperation and timely response to our data request. In this entire stack of reports, that is the only place at which the GAO addressed the issue of cooperativeness with its agencies and investigations, and it was a completely positive statement, not a negative statement. Yet now we are told by the same agency that we have an unusually poor record of cooperation. 
Let me say one other thing about this report. They focus on preparations, as they should have, in the period leading up to the census. Not a single one of them alerts us to an area in which, in fact, we are ill-prepared. That is, how to simultaneously do a census and explain what we are doing in real time to our oversight agencies. We have a huge number of requests for site visits in the next three weeks. The monitoring board is only one of them. The GAO reports have never said to us over the last two years, look, you better put in some extra staff just to deal with the oversight apparatus. So if their intent was to help us prepare for the census, the one thing they did not help us prepare for and didn't even ever address was the question of how can you staff up in the middle of the census for all of the oversight apparatus that's going to, uh, that's going to, to, to come your way. I would have loved it if they would have given us some kind of advance warning on this. But let's not talk just about the past. I'd like to tell you what GAO has asked for and what we are providing. GAO has asked for our cost and progress system, which reports on 55 operations at every level of geography and operations. This includes, for example, number of persons recruited, number of persons hired for each operation by their pre-employment status, employed, retired, including targeted recruitment pools such as welfare to work, beneficiaries, persons under special waivers for non-citizens, federal assistance, annuits, annuitants, current federal employees, recipients of public housing assistance, and any other waivers that may become available to the Bureau. Number of employees quitting, resigning, terminated, involuntarily separated, uh, etc. Actual staff turnover rates, number of applicants in various stages of hiring, and so forth. That's just under uh, labor force participation. Then in our production system, this cost and progress data includes total caseload assumptions for each and every questionnaire delivery operations, that is update leave, list enumerate, visit enumerate, update urban, update leave, et cetera, number of possible mail back responses for all questionnaire delivery, separate count for the number of mail out un undeliverables, initial total caseload for non-response follow-up, subsequent estimate of total in our FU, non-response follow-up caseload, incorporating late mailback responses, number of hours work, training hours, overtime hours, total earnings, number of employees receiving pay for listers and enumerators. Excuse me, there's no, uh, there's no question there's lots of requests, but you don't need to read every single well, item. We don't have time, but oh, uh, okay. I it, mean, no, I, it, I understand. I've I mean, just know. started. But, with well, this I mean, you're welcome to do that, but I'm telling you, okay. uh, you know, then we don't have, no, should you decide what oversight should have? No, That's sir. Most I'm gonna, I will turn to that question. Okay. I'd like to ask that way. The data that they have requested and that we are providing we are providing in real time is a terabyte of information, a terabyte. It's hard to know what a terabyte is if you can't kind of visualize it. It is the equivalent of 16,000 CD-ROMs, or if the imagination is still focused on a paper record, a terabyte, this is the Yellow Pages, the Washington, D.C., a terabyte is not 50 of these, or 500 of these, or 5 million of these, a terabyte is 50 million of these. That is how much information we are giving to GAO. Now, if providing in real time the equivalent of 50 million phone books, or 16,000 CD-ROMs, is being uncooperative, I'd hate to think what the more cooperative agencies are providing to the GAO. But now let me address your straight question. Whose job is it to decide what oversight is? It is not mine. It is certainly yours. It is the U.S. Congress's. I appreciate that. Obviously, Congress needs this information to discharge its oversight responsibilities. That is a terabyte of information in real time over the next uh, uh, 10, 10 weeks. But I have to pose the question to you. Do you need it in real time on the assumption that somehow the census can actually be managed on a daily basis by the U.S. Congress? For example, in your opening comment, let's try it. I mean, I'm well past my five minutes. I've got over, well, over if, 10 if minutes, the I permission, think. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, I said you addressed uh, this at some length. Your, and, yeah. Right, right. Um, in your opening comment, you address the, uh, the error on the uh, address letter. Now, 
Do you want to know that in real time in order to fix it? Because it, it can't happen that way. You can't fix problems with a geo process. You can't manage the census that way. You can exercise oversight. You can exercise whether we have committed fraud or inefficiencies or corruption, uh, mismanagement funds. But it's very hard for me to imagine why you need a terabyte of information in real time. We're providing it uh, at, at, uh, at some extra cost to us to sort of get it all to you on time, get it to the GAO. I mean, our so, only responsibility is if it's only concerning fraud? I mean, uh, we, no, no. We, no, I, I, I'm just saying that, uh, that if the GAO's task is to see if we have appropriately spent the taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. they will be able to do that because all this information is available. You know, Mr. Chairman, you said very wisely, I thought very wisely, as a matter of fact, some time ago, that perhaps the job that I now hold is the job for a general. And, uh, no, and I, I took it seriously. I, I, I seriously did. And I've often reflected upon that comment and asked myself, what would General Schwarzkopf do under these circumstances? If the GAO were, GAO were to do a real-time audit of Desert Storm, to what purpose would that have been done? Let us say there was an auditor in an armed vehicle being positioned on the Iraqi-Kuwait border, and the GAO auditor judge that the operator of that vehicle did not uh, make a competent reading of the GPS data. And so the auditor then said to this operator, look, I don't think you're putting this vehicle in the right place. The operator knows it's in the right place because he understands the larger strategy that's going on. He now has the following choice. He has to stop and explain to the analogy. auditor. Well, <laughs> sir, when you're trying to put... It's a crazy when analogy to say that we're, you know, it's like oh, going to, you know, well, I, I tell you, we, we're, we're using it an awful lot of time. We just have a problem here. I mean, it's, if it's real or perceived, it's a problem. If you want a transparent census, we need to feel that the people who have oversight response all four agencies of the government have access. That's all we're asking. And so, you know. Sir, a terabyte of information strikes me as a lot of transparency. Well, I'm telling you, everybody is complaining about it, and I'm listening to the complaints from all the aid people, and I haven't talked to Inspector General, but the other ones, that they're saying there's a problem. Now, we're going to have this hearing. If we, if you, you know, I hope you'll meet with everybody and see if there's a better way to open up, and because uh, we're going to be going through some critical times these next months, and if we're going to be you know, obstructing and delaying. I mean, what the GAO is saying is something you know you have information, and then it takes weeks to still get it. Why are we, you know, and, and there's, I think you just built unnecessary, your staffs have built unnecessary barriers here, and it, you know, it ultimately goes down to the Commerce Department, it sounds like, and, and then the politicians get involved in, wait a minute, you know. So anyway, I mean, you know, we just, you know, need to avoid this problem. I guarantee you, and Ms. Maloney will come up and defend you here in a minute, but I tell you, Mr. Waxman and Mr. Dingo would not have tolerated one bit of this when they were chairman. Uh, well, I, I, we have to understand what, uh, what, what 50 uh, phone books full of data mean. If that's not in real time, if that's not transparency, it's hard for me to imagine what is transparency. You, for example, quoted the fact that the monitoring board says that we have 30 outstanding requests. Uh, that's not our understanding. We have two outstanding requests. We get requests to the monitoring board on a constant flow basis. There's always some outstanding by definition. I do not know where that 30 comes from. Well, uh, actually, I'm going to we'll submit this for the record. This is something they gave me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, this is not all the outstanding ones. These are all the number of all the delays it takes to get information and varies. Um, there's refused data requests and such. Um, we have a problem. And I mean, I mean, are you denying there's a problem? I guess I, you know, I'm just telling you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sir, I, you know, this is going to affect the, you know, the, truly, I the respect that. for the census right. when we get through this process. And unless we can feel we have access to information, everybody's going to be suspect of it. Yeah. And I, I, I really, you know, this was, you know, this kind of really upset me when I read this document, the arrogance of it, to say that we cannot ever have, unless we have two weeks' notice. I've never had any agency in the, you know, in Congress. I mean, I'm, this is only my eighth year, and I don't do much oversight. But I've never had anyone tell me that I have to give two weeks. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't. I mean, I, you know, we should try in every effort. But here it says it's absolutely, you know, that way. Yep. And I, you know, I just... I, I apologize if the language was arrogant. I, 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 my recollection of that letter is that we sent it as early as we could to try to create some sort, some sort of systematic way to uh, uh, accommodate all of the requests that we're getting for site visits, which is a large number of requests. 
the GA, the uh, monitoring board letter um, uh, in the next 20 days has, as we know. Uh, and, and you're going to have to fly in a regional director every one of those one-hour visits, I guess, is that's what your policy is. That's a waste of your time and effort, <laughs> it sounds like to me. That's what you're saying, that you either have the regional director or an assistant regional census manager accompany any of these people. They're one-hour visits. Well, that's a lot of waste of your efficiency, I think. I well, uh, we, we, we don't know what the visits are. We know that in the past, the people who've been asking us for visits, we have had to stop the operation. We have to set up training systems. We have to do things, sir. This is, we are actually doing the census now. We're right, actually in the middle of it, okay. as I, I just said. Because we've, I'm, we've gone a little bit longer. I apologize okay. for the time. The, um, let me just ask you two things. I mean, we're going to have a hearing, and we're going to have other people besides these agencies testify and find out more background on this and what the legal requirements are, so we have it clarified. But will you arrange for a meeting with the four different agencies involved so they're all in the room together, maybe you've done this, and, uh, and see if we can get it cleared up that, you know, everybody feels that this is going to be a transparent Absolutely census. You sure. want a transparent census. I want a transparent census. And uh, uh, let's see if we can get a better working uh, relationship. I absolutely. Okay. We'd be delighted. In fact, I've requested that meeting. I requested that meeting some time ago from well, the monitoring board, both chairmen. I've never gotten an answer for their letter. I wrote you in August uh, a, a letter saying I, I was worried about this situation okay. and, and asked for a meeting. And I did not get a response to that letter. Well, so we very much would welcome that meeting. Let's jointly write a letter to them all <laughs> good, good. Uh, and uh, say let's have this meeting. I mean, minority and majority sides should be involved. Both sides on the monitoring board should be involved. Um, because w this perception is going to get more of a problem. I mean, it may not be that real, but I think it's real and perception. Um, Ms. Maloney, I apologize for taking so much time. It, it seems to me that um, as the director is designing and implementing the most uh, difficult uh, part of the, the census, he's not being criticized for the task of running an appropriate and thorough census. He's being criticized for not answering all the questions about the job that everybody seems to say that he's doing all right and doing well. And I, I just um, would like, you were cut off, and I'd like to hear more about all of these requests that you're getting to answer questions. You know, I, just to mention some that, that I'm aware of, because I've read the reports, the GAO, very thorough questioning, the monitoring board, they want 31 visits, what, in two weeks? Is that correct? 31 visits. We weren't notified, but 31 visits they want. Uh, this subcommittee, um, I, I see him regularly, every week at least, at a subcommittee meeting, it seems like. The National Academy of Sciences and all their committees, and the advisory committees that you've set up, certainly the IGs from the Commerce Department, to name a few. But you were cut off when you were going through all of these requests. and. Uh, I would like to hear all these requests that you're getting to provide information on your job. And uh, sometimes do you think uh, it's possibly they're trying to obstruct your ability to do your job by demanding you to spend the majority of your time answering questions about your job? And I'd like to ask about reinventing government. I know that the vice president, and I supported his efforts, uh, went out with a very aggressive campaign to cut back on the number of people in government. We now have the smallest government we've ever had. And possibly uh, we might look at a new um, form of structuring your office where you have a whole unit that does nothing but answer questions. Now, I must tell you, some people think the census is you go out and you print a form at, at a Xerox place. You and I know, Dan, this is highly complicated. I spend a lot of, of my time answering questions to my colleagues in Congress. Uh, the, the census is an important um, system. It's an important uh, goal, it's, and it's complicated. And so I'd, I'd re really like you to put in the record and go through everybody who is requesting all of this information. And I would also like a report from you. I don't want to ask for more paperwork, but I'd, I'd like a, an estimate of how much of your time and your major senior staff time has to go into answering questions. We know many people work for the Census Bureau, Dan, but only people in supervisory positions can answer some of these questions. And, uh, and so I'd like to a sense of how much of their time and is this constant demand for information impeding their ability to get 
the, as you've said, as Dan said, we all say the most comprehensive, largest peacetime effort and, and mobilization ever in our country, the greatest civic responsibility of every citizen to be involved. And, and I know that uh, I see the outreach in my own community I, with the census bus and forms and everything else and my own mail, that, the mail form that came to me over the weekend. And I did an informal survey, all of my staff and a lot of my friends got the, the form. So it seems like the operations are moving forward. People aren't criticizing the operations moving forward. What we appear to hear is a complaint that of the how many different entities are asking questions aren't getting all of their detailed questions answered, some of which may be repetitive and uh, some of which may uh, impede the ability to do their job. If, I, if all I had to do, if I had to respond every day to the, the GA, uh, GAO monitoring board, IGs, and not to mention every politician, including myself and yourself, who are constantly asking questions, uh, we couldn't get our job done. So I would like to hear in the record how many different groups are asking for information, how much m information it is. Do you have the staff to respond to all of these questions? And I'd just like to give you as much time as you need to explain what all of these requests are doing to your time and your ability to oversee a very important uh, function of the federal government. Uh, yes, Congresswoman Maloney, uh, if you'll permit me, I, I will start with an anecdote that came to mind as I was listening to Chairman Miller's uh, opening comment. Um, uh, Norman Borlaug, who got a Nobel Prize, uh, he was an e agronomist, um, was based at a research uh, station in Mexico during the Green Revolution. Norman Borlaug was a very, very important scientist with respect to uh, corn breeding. And the headquarters used to send him requests all the time for information. And Norman Borlaug finally got frustrated and cabled back. That was back in the days of cables, 1950s. Cabled back, did you send me down here to grow paper or to grow corn? Well, I sometimes feel as if I've been sent to the Census Bureau to uh, produce reports, not to produce a census. And I'm very anxious about that because we're really in the middle of it now. And I want to produce a census for this country, not just produce endless reports and, and site visits. Now, that is not an attack on oversight responsibilities. That is simply a question of, is the oversight process supposed to do real-time auditing, and if so, is that because the oversight process can somehow manage the census? By the time the auditors finish their work, come back, write a report, give it to us for comments, we then comment and it comes down here and then you have a hearing to tell me that we should have done something differently in our recruitment system, it is too late. We have already fixed that problem. If we didn't fix it, we were in trouble. We're fixing problems all day long, every day. One of the problems, you ask, how much time? I would estimate that in terms of our senior management time, when we get together to talk two or three times a week about where we are, what the issues are, half of our time, and this is a sort of nine or ten people, half of our time is spent in conversations about how to be responsive to the GAO, the IG, the subcommittee, the National Academy, the advisory, at least half of our time is spent on those issues. That's a lot when you're actually doing a census. Uh, your offer to put into the record the actual documentation of the request. Let me assemble that systematically and I will provide that for the record. Would you, would you like to elaborate on all of the requests that come into your office? I'd just like to hear about it. What is your day like? Do you go in there and you go to work and then you get a, get a call that you need another report done? It, just I'd like to elaborate on, on all of this requests that are coming in. Surely. Um, well, the, the uh, I would say about a third of the day, a normal day, there's no such thing as a normal day when you're actually doing a census, but about a third of the day are these brush fire problems. Uh, for example, uh, there are large numbers of members of, of, of the U.S. Congress uh, who are uh, concerned about whether they have enough of something, enough offices, enough advertising, enough recruitment, enough jobs, enough something in their districts. So. The phone uh, bank and the letters will be coming in from members of Congress. 
And that's quite separate from official oversight. That's just, that's one-on-one -on -one stuff. It's very time-consuming, very time-consuming. Uh, uh, we tried to be very responsive to Congressman Ryan uh, on one issue. Uh, that was uh, in terms of senior personnel time, including myself, other senior people, regional directors. I would say the total man hours that went into that letter could have easily been 40, 50 hours. That was one constituent asking one question, which turned out to be misframed. It was, I lost six weeks of salary. It turns out six weeks ago, we lost one week of salary, which was made up the next week. We get those all the time. We have to do as best we can in responding to them. So let us say that's about a third of the day. Brush fires, not just congressional, all the other brush fires are going out all over the country all of the time, all these small things that come and go. Then I would say about a third of the day is spent with the, the official oversight process, one way or the other, either getting materials ready for hearing, getting materials ready for a report, having conversation about what we ought to be doing and not be doing, how do we handle, for example, give you an example that we dealt with just yesterday. There are requests for uh, the, uh, all of the complete count committees. There are about 9,000 complete count committees. The complete count committees are not ours. They're established by local mayors and local governors. They're not Census Bureau complete count committees. By what authority do I share the list and the contact name of these 9,000 committees to somebody who just asked me? I don't know what the mailing is going to be to those people. They didn't, they didn't join up to be uh, visited by the GAO or the IG. They joined up to try to do a census. Nevertheless, we spent an hour and a half struggling with that issue just yesterday. So there's about a third of the day goes into that kind of problem. And then I would think about a third of the day actually goes into trying to manage the census, uh, trying to deal with the local census offices that don't have their recruitment is below target. What are we going to do in those offices? Do we move people and so forth? So I would say that um, on a normal day, uh, close to a third of our time is spent with the, the oversight apparatus. And it comes from a large number of sources. And that's different from individual congressional requests, uh, because I don't put that in that same category. These are just questions are being raised by, by members of Congress and by mayors. I put that in the, you know, so. You know. Now, the exciting thing about this census, and I, it's really very exciting. I'm very pleased to be here, uh, uh, quite honestly. Um, a lot of people think they own this census. A lot of people, thousands of people, our partners, our mayors, our governors, members of Congress, all think that they now sort of own this census. That's very healthy for this society. We're very excited to be running that kind of census. However, when you share ownership, it creates lots of pressures on you. So that's, that's what it is. I can be happy to, to provide that more systematically. Sir, sir. Fine. We're going to do a couple of rounds. Let me get with Ryan because he may not sure. be able to come back. He can take a round. Then we'll come back and take some rounds. That's all right. Okay. Mr. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Dr. Porter, actually, I was coming prepared to defend you today until um, <laughs> <laughs> till I heard that one. Um, <laughs> Let me, excuse me. You're, you're an honest man, Mr. Ryan. You, that won't deter you at all. Yeah, let me just clarify what happened in Racine, Wisconsin. When a senior management person at your local census office in my district of Racine, Wisconsin, tells me that many employees aren't getting their paychecks, and he sends me a letter to that effect, and he's an official of the Census Bureau, I think that's a very serious claim, and I think that is a very serious thing. I, I'm sorry it took you 50 man hours to figure that out. Uh, I don't know how long it takes you to figure those things out, but that was a very legitimate question, I think. Oh, surely. No, um, yes, sir. We took it legitimately. I would like to use a military anecdote, if I may, for a second. I had the, the pleasure and the opportunity to have breakfast with Colin Powell not too long ago with a handful of other members of con Congress. And he laid out for us what he calls the Powell Doctrine. The Powell Doctrine basically is the lessons we learned from the Vietnam War was that politicians were running the war, picking the bombing targets, running the war, and we had the, the whole policy of incrementalism. Wrong way to do that. What we learned in the Gulf War under the Powell Doctrine was let the experts do it. Let the experts run the war. Let, let the military experts who know the, how to do their jobs do those jobs. That's, that's, I think that's an appropriate anecdote for this situation, and I really sympathize with what you're doing, uh, and I think you're, you're the right person for the job. But also, we're all concerned about the census. Everybody believes we have ownership in the census. This is the greatest non-military civil civic exercise we ever engage in here. So oversight is critical. Oversight is very important, and it is a congressional responsibility to have oversight. When we are told by members who 
of the Census Bureau that paychecks aren't going, getting mailed out, whether that's true or not, we have to react and do oversight on those things because it's just around the corner. Uh, when we have calls and we're finding out that we don't have enough people in Wisconsin, we have a very tight labor market, we need more people to uh, fill out the applications so we can get the enumerators out there when that happens. We're concerned about that. I've been on TV for three weeks at home telling people, call, 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 you know, please, we need applications. Um, which leads me to my question. Uh, I have here just the, the letter I got in the mail about the census, and it's a letter from you um, saying we need help hiring temporary workers throughout the United States to help complete the census. Uh, call the local census office near you for more information. The phone number is available from the directory assistance or at the Internet, and then it lists your website. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, and, and the complaints I've been getting is I'm sure you've thought this through. I'm, I want to see why didn't you just put your 800 number in there uh, instead of asking people to do dial up 75 cents uh, for directory assistance. Uh, I've been giving your 800 number. I don't have it off by heart. I thought I did, but I've been giving your 800 number all over the place. Why didn't you just throw the 800 number in there, which is a national number? doesn't matter where you are. You can call it, and then they route you to your local census office so you can get the, the information on how you fill out the application. That extra expense and extra required action I'm fearful is going to delay people or just stop people from actually uh, inquiring. No, uh, uh, Congressman Ryan, I, that's a completely legitimate question. And I, I didn't, by the way, if I could return to the first part, um, I, I thought your question was legitimate. <coughs> uh, that's why we took it so seriously. But sometimes those questions actually are stimulated by a pretty little thing. The way it got to you it made it sound like a much bigger problem than it turned out to be. Uh, we both found that out. And so I did not think the question was, was inappropriate. I was simply using that as a way to suggest that the day is full of those kinds of things, which when we look hard at them, they turn out not to amount to quite as much as, uh, as, as what appeared. It's just like. a helpful suggestion. I think maybe you don't need to have a manager for all these site visits. I've just actually popped into the local census office, just walked around and talked to people and asked them you know, how things are going. Uh, when you responded to my question about this particular instance, you sent four people from your Chicago office to drive up. Uh, it's take half a day to meet me in my Racine office when you know, all you could have done is just given me a call and saying, here's what happened. It's been taken care of. That took four of your man hours from your regional people driving up from Chicago to Racine, Wisconsin to explain that everything's okay. Uh, it was a nice meeting, but I thought it was kind of a waste of time. Oh. So I hope you can consider about, you know, maybe you can do this in a little faster. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. uh, we, do, we do take requests from members of the subcommittee very seriously. Um, but to your other question, I think it's a fair question, um, the um, phone number question. Before you got in the room, I did uh, mention that uh, after the advance letter went out, we were getting to that website. We were getting about uh, uh, 1,000, uh, uh, 100,000 hits a week, excuse me, 100,000 hits a day, and it jumped to 1 million the next day. So it really has worked. Uh, I honestly do not have a good explanation for your question. Is that, do we have the number at that point? Yeah, I think we simply didn't have the number when that letter was being The 800 number, yeah, you didn't have right, it. Yeah, right, right. Because there's, we've now got that number everywhere we can have it. It's 1-888-325-7733. If that's anyone's right. listening and wants a census job, that's the number, 1-888-325-7733. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. uh, and I think we simply did not have it. We did not want to route them directly to the local offices because you can't do that in a letter very well because you're, this is a mass mailing. So I think that's the simple explanation. Just when you went to print, you didn't have the 800 exactly. number? Exactly. That, that's correct. Okay. Um, I think we have a vote, so I'll yield back my time. Um, we'll take a recess. We have three votes. I'm guessing we'll be back in 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll stand in recess. have the committee uh, reconvene. Uh, um, Ms. Maloney is on her way back, but rather than taking up time, let's just go ahead and continue, and I have some more questions. Um, I also see in the audience here today that Dr. Barbara Bryant, your, uh, one of your predecessors, who uh, was sitting in that exact seat exactly 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was before my time involved in Congress, certainly, so we're glad you could uh, come as an observer. She's 
testified as a witness before since uh, we've had the subcommittee recreated. Um, let me switch over to the subject of the pre-notification letter, which we talked about, and get some more uh, uh, clarification. There's two problems um, with it, the, the, the uh, single-digit problem. And the other problem, and we're getting calls into offices, is this issue about, you know, and I think it was an article, I think, in the Washington Post that said, you know, wish you had put an extra sentence in English on the bottom of the letter. Uh, my neighbor called me next door back in Brady before I flew home back up here yesterday. What's this about? And understanding, and people are confused by the envelope. Um, so it just, again, it's not, I don't think it's going to affect the end result, obviously, but uh, it just is a perception problem again. Um, before you, you, you came on board, we had a debate on the issue of the second mailing, which, I mean, that was a decision was made before your arrival here. And um, for, you know, that was tested in the dress rehearsal. And it showed, I think, 7 to 15% increase in response. But it was, the decision was made even though you know, we'd express our opinion that it, we should go for the second, second mailing, uh, that, that because this pre-notification was going to um, solve the problem. What, you know, that was, was that ever pre-tested, the, the pre-notification as comparable to the second questionnaire, do you know? Uh, as follows, uh, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, and when, what kind of response are you expecting that right. the pre-notification will help? Huh? Exactly. The pre-notification pre letter was pre-tested uh, back in the early 90s as part of the package, that is the so-called three-mailing package. That is the pre-notification letter, then the form, and then the postcard follow-up. And based upon those tests, we estimated that response rate could be affected by as much as 6%. Most of that, it turns out, is attributable to the postcard reminder. You got the biggest bump from that. Uh, the questionnaire bump has to do with the fact that it's more user-friendly. Obviously, there's going to be a questionnaire irrespective, uh, but, uh, but the making it a more user-friendly questionnaire we thought would increase. So the pre-notification letter, um, it was our estimate uh, that it would increase by perhaps as much as 2%, somewhere between 1.5% and, and 2% uh, response rate. That was for the pre-notification? The pre-notification one letter. one and a half to 2%. Yes. How about the post, the, I mean, the uh, post-questionnaire card? That's a postcard. The postcard, right? which is basically a thank you reminder. Uh, no, that, that we, we estimated could be as high as 3%. Okay. So the total package was a 6% mm -hmm. uh, bump in response rate. Uh, indeed, at that time, we were estimating the um, uh, response rate to be about 55% based upon our modeling of the demography and, and other response rates. And it was those combination of three things, a notification letter, a user-friendly questionnaire, and a reminder postcard that moved us from 55 to 61%. Um, this this single digit problem uh, doesn't sound too big this is a single digit <laughs> except for 120 million times it's really it, it was a problem is really a quality check problem I think I mean you know, you know how did at this stage can you explain how the quality check did not work and what other quality checks are in place to make sure this doesn't happen again uh, uh, yes sir um, the quality check process worked right uh, uh, the flaw was the specification in the quality process. Uh, here's what happened. Uh, we ran our test deck on the advanced letter, and uh, it tested out exactly correctly. That is, all features of the test letter tested out, including the address and so forth. Sometime between that test deck and the production run, we uh, were still negotiating about some of the, the, the uh, language text. We were in very active conversation with our uh, uh, advisory committee with respect to language. And under their urging, uh, we made some modifications in the language. What that meant is you opened up the software. Now, the software that got opened up was simply the text file software, not the address software, so we presumed. And so after the uh, software was closed, production run starts, we then focused upon those things which we thought might have changed, i.e., uh, if there was any problem in the, uh, in, the, in the language translation. The other thing we focused on, we actually do a, um, a, a, a approximately 200 cases every four hours of all of our production runs. And we pull those cases out, batches of them, send them to Jeffersonville, and they run through separate quality control processes. The quality control processes in Jeffersonville were focused sort of exclusively on the parts of the address which were operational. We were very concerned that the barcode 
matched front and back and that the barcode that we had matched the address that the uh, post office had as its mailing address barcode. All of those things tested out perfectly. And the mistake in our, our, our quality check is that the, there was simply wasn't a provision in the quality check to go back and look at something which was not operational except for the language part. We went back and we looked at all the language part to make sure it was all right. Uh, and it was simply, a, it, it wasn't a failure of the quality control, it was a failure of the specifications, not to respect that particular uh, uh, data field. Okay, so, uh, but it was basically, a, it was a failure in designing the quality check then. I, in that sense, yes, sir. Right, I mean, because it was, there right. should have been another quality check that of, of caught that. that of so that field. That's yes. where the um, problem. Yes, yes. Um, so it was the specifications rather than a failure of the process itself. The process worked the way it was specified. But the specifications were, yeah. Um, we went ahead and started, knew, you know, that you're right on your way. Let me, on the same issue, let me just kind of ask another question, go my time, over my time, but then um, we'll even it out here. Um, this question that, um, of not putting a sentence at the end of the letter saying in, in English what this was on the backside, because what, people didn't know what the envelope was about right. unless you, you know, could read any of those five languages and such. It was a, it was a question of confusion. Yeah, you know, and I think, it, I think the Washington Post said, Bureau wish, you know, admits they should have done that. Uh, yes, sir. I, excuse yeah, me. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, you know, um, that, that, that was maybe a quality check or a focus group or how did, you know, why couldn't we have caught that, I wonder? Uh, uh, that I, I would describe as a judgment error uh, more than a, than a kind of processing or quality check error. Um, and I, I, I can explain it, but I don't intend to try to excuse it. Uh, but the, um, the explanation is, quite honestly, that this is one of the operations is the first operation that we have put into the census in 2000, which was not pre-tested. The reason for that is after the dress rehearsal, when we realized we could not do a target mailing to different language groups, we converted the advance letter from simply a pre-notification letter to a carry the second burden of being the mechanism by which you got the language form. So it took on a second task and our attention on making sure it worked well for that task was so intense and focused that, quite honestly, we lost sight of the fact that it had a different task, which is the 80% of the American population that doesn't speak one of these five languages, or the 90% or, or whatever. So we were extremely focused upon the language dimension of that letter. And so that's why I say it was a judgment error. Uh, the letter was printed exactly the way we spec'd it out. There's no problem in, in the, the letter itself. In retrospect, it certainly should have included a sentence which said uh, the envelope is for the people who want. Um, the concern at that time, uh, these letters are, um, are examined and talked about and argued in focus groups and so forth, and the concern at that time was let's, let's keep this letter as, as, again, clean as possible uh, with respect to its task. And I think if we had pre-tested it, we would have gotten some of the responses that we've now gotten uh, with respect to the confusion, uh, and we would have then changed it. But it was an operation that, because of when it happened, happened after the dress rehearsal, and there simply was no time to, to pretest it. I learned from that, uh, and we've had this conversation uh, last summer when we were talking about additional operations. I learned from that that we simply should not put something in unless it's absolutely mandatory because the census is at risk. We should not put in operations which we've been unable to to field test because that's the way mistakes get made in a, in a process like this. I, so it's, it was an error in judgment, not in process. Uh, it's again regrettable. Uh, I think the only um, sort of saving grace, or not saving grace, but the thing I would mention, uh, we're, we're trying to track as best we can the kind of the current attitudes of the public with respect to the, to the census. And uh, we ran a survey, or some partners on behalf of the Census Bureau ran a survey over the weekend just as the letter was coming out. Uh, the level of awareness is very high. 89% of the American public is now saying that it's aware of the census. Uh, and that's, that's unprecedented at this stage in the census. 84% um, can actually uh, uh, describe some of the features of a census. So it's, it's not only just general awareness, it's a very, very high. Um, and when you ask uh, the people, are they going to cooperate, those numbers are very, very high. That doesn't mean it will happen but at least it's in very encouraging. The, the, uh, we have reason to believe. Look, I, I, I make no excuse. Uh, I don't want to sound like I am. On the other hand, the number of calls that we've gotten in email uh, is well, well under a percent. Almost any mass mailing 
generates at least 1% of people who don't like it for one reason or another. So uh, we don't yet see this as a serious, you know, public Log relations. In the call. I mean, we're getting calls in the office. I mean, it's yeah. not, oh, no, it's we not are large too. numbers. Sure. Of being, and, but other members are calling us about it. And, sure, surely. Um, no, I, I, uh, but do you, have any, do you log in the numbers throughout all the... Oh, yeah, certainly. I, I, uh, like how much... Well, I've only logged in central headquarters, central headquarters in Suitland. I haven't logged in. The, they're certainly occurring in the region as well. Uh, yeah. But I would say, uh, as of last night, when I checked on this, the central headquarters was easily 200 mm -hmm. um, emails and phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could easily get to a million, could easily get to a percent. Mm -hmm. um, whether that will affect the census or not, I, I, it, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, the forms are on their way. Yeah. Look, right. some of the forms are already... But it, reaching it's people. It, it's more of a public relations. It, it, There's yes a second sir. public relations that's issue right. on the first big it's, public thing. And it's, but the advertising is going well, so that's the, the really the earliest public, you know, communication issue. That's they are, and, and all the partnership work, uh, uh, well over a half million people have already uh, uh, participated in one of the road tour um, uh, events. Um, we've had a series of meetings with ministers lately. The uh, sense of Sabbath idea is really catching. We think it'll be very big. Um, so I... It is a public relations uh, embarrassment. I regret it, uh, again, as I did the, uh, the the digit problem. But if I really believed that it was going right. to threaten the census, I would be doing something. And I simply don't think it is. Maloney. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, um, could you, what would you recommend to respond to really the chairman's concern that he's raising over oversight, uh, wanting more oversight and uh, more transparent oversight. What would you recommend could be done that's not going to interfere with the professionals doing their job but would address his concerns? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would like to say, um, I, both as a citizen, as a political scientist, and now as a member of, um, of the executive branch, um, I believe very strongly in the oversight responsibilities of the United States Congress. I, I, I have no, no hesitancy about that, and I do think that if you if you go back through the GAO reports, if you go back through your own uh, committee request, um, if you even go back looking at site visit requests from subcommittee staff, uh, from monitoring board, to my knowledge, not a single request has not in one way or the other been, been acceded to and responded to. Uh, site visits all took place all through the summer successfully. Many of them took a full day. They weren't one hour visits. They took a full day. Uh, we accommodated all of them. We've accommodated the monitoring board fully thus far. So it is not a kind of a resistance to either site visits or, or information flows or what have you. I think the, the concern I have right now is, is the real-time nature of this, <coughs> which is that we, we need a, a lot of stuff right now. And right now is also when we're doing the census. And so I think my, my advice to, to Mr. Miller would be indeed the advice he gave to me which was that, in effect, I believe it would be very important to have the four key agencies, uh, the subcommittee, the GAO, uh, the IG, and, well, those three, uh, especially, and perhaps the NAS, that's less, less central to this conversation, um, convene quickly. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm in a bit of a bind. We actually have already, we think, worked out with your subcommittee uh, staff uh, request for uh, site visits, but we haven't worked it out yet with the monitoring board. Um, indeed, I just had during the break a, a conversation with, uh, with Chris Mim from the GAO, and he believes that we're uh, practically there with respect to an understanding of what they need. So there's some sort of disjunction between uh, the, the, the commentary and really what, what we headway we think we have made. But I'm now in a bind because I think you're right. It would be very useful to all get in the room together and try to work out a strategy for the next uh, uh, a period. In the meantime, I have a letter from Mr. Blackwell who simply rejects our guidelines. Those are guidelines, they're not rules, and I'm very sorry if the language appeared to be arrogant. Uh, uh, I really do apologize for that. But they were guidelines to help us do this. These are guidelines, by the way, that affect only the people actually doing operations. They're not the guidelines for coming to Suitland. They're not the guidelines for getting data. They're only guidelines affecting people who are actually doing something. Training, or recruiting, or delivering forms, or checking in forms. And I really cannot have those people's schedules disrupted without some sort of warning, some sort of preparation for that. I think if you brought me back here in two or three weeks and we were in a serious operational problem because we spent so much time dealing with people who needed to be visiting us and oversighting and so forth, then you would, you know, it would not be a very happy uh, 
uh, hearing. So I think my, my advice, uh, uh, Congresswoman Maloney, is to have the meeting as quickly as we can that, uh, that Congressman Miller uh, uh, recommended and to try to have that in such a way that by the time you have a hearing on the 23rd, there will be no questions about transparency because I really do not think there are questions about transparency. I think there are questions about whether you can do a real-time audit of an operation as complicated as, as Census 2000. Well, in terms of uh, oversight, I, Mr. Chairman, I would like to, to uh, hear from the monitoring board, both sides. What is it they're looking for? And what are they doing? I think it'd be appropriate that we not only have the GAO in to report to us and Mr. Pruitt to report to us, but uh, the monitoring board, uh, which we funded uh, quite generously, if I recall. Um, what are they doing? What I think is interesting in all of this oversight, and it continues, and I believe in oversight, that none of it has focused on any, quote, major problem, or nor has it found any, quote, major problem. It's just been a review and a report on a census that seems to be going forward in, 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 in the process that it was supposed to do. And I would just like to focus on some good news for, for a while. I, I know that last year at about this time, we had uh, just had a Supreme Court ruling. We were in a partisan fight over the funding of the census. And quite frankly, now we're in a very positive uh, framework. We have the funding. We have uh, mailings that are going out that I received, my staff received, that uh, the adv advertising campaign is going forward. Um, I, I think the new vans are an incredibly positive addition to the outreach to the community. I think they're very effective. You could use more of them. Could you just give us some good news on what's happening at the Census Bureau? Can you just tell us some uh, uh, good, good, good projects that are happening and, and some good news about what's happening? Well, uh, as you said, the, 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 the promotional activity is really very well um, um, advanced. Uh, I think the number of school kits, for example, which are out there, about 1.5 million. Uh, as I said, about a half a million people have already visited the, the road van, the road van tour. Uh, that has visited, done something, interacted with the van, not just seen it. Uh, I just shared with you some some uh, survey data, where, um, as I want to make sure I say it right, um, uh, 80, 85 percent had seen or heard about the census and had some reasonable level of, of information about it. Um, and about 86, 87 percent said they would definitely or probably return uh, the census form. Uh, there is a residual 4 or 5 percent who are saying no. Look, a census is always about the last 5 percent, mm -hmm. always about the last 5 percent, whether it's the problem with recruitment, whether it's the problem with response rate, whether it's the problem with uh, any operation, it's always the last 5 percent. That, that is the challenge for a census, which has to go to 100 percent. Uh, nevertheless, I'm very gratified and, 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 and encouraged by the level of, of public attention and positive attention that the census uh, has already uh, received. Uh, most importantly, and I'll return to my written testimony here, the, the issues that we deal with all day long, every day, uh, from bomb threats to uh, public relations uh, problems uh, to uh, local rec census officers, we need to improve our recruitment rate. All of those are manageable problems. We have yet to hit a problem which is going to, as I say, somehow put the census at risk. It may happen tomorrow, uh, but as I sit here today, we have not hit that problem. I think we are poised to have a very successful census. A higher than expected response rate uh, doesn't mean we will get a 100% response rate, of course. Um, and to go back to Chairman Miller's comment, if I could, about non-response follow-up, uh, obviously if we have a higher than expected response rate, it's going to enormously help us in the workload during non-response uh, follow-up. And to go back to the, um, the 1990 numbers, um, my recollection is that we planned uh, non-response follow-up for six weeks, not 10 weeks. In certain offices, it took 16 weeks, but the actual plan was only for six weeks. So we actually have added four weeks to non-response follow-up in the, in the 2000 design from 1990, a longer period. And as I've testified before, uh, Mr. Miller, um, uh, we will keep counting until we have exhausted our procedures. And if that takes all summer, we will count all summer. Uh, we will count until we have exhausted our procedures. I appreciate that that's not your view, the one that you quoted. I really do appreciate that it's not your view. I do appreciate that that view is out there. 
but I don't think that, um, that a lot of site visits in March are going to make people feel better. The only way we can prove that is by doing it come the end of June and the, and the early part of July. We've got to prove it by simply doing it, and we will do it. Earlier, you made mention, and, and both of us uh, have commented, and I must uh, compliment the chairman for his really very uh, sound statements on, on the, the official census mailing that, that mimicked it was a fundraising uh, letter for the Southeast Legal Foundation, uh, but it was uh, mimicked and actually looked to me like an official mailing. And I, I really want to know, um, do you think more of these type of shenanigans will take place, that, and how disruptive are they to the official census? Yeah, it's very hard for me to anticipate. Uh, I, I live, I tell you, you... You didn't ask me, but I'll answer this question anyway. What keeps me up awake at night? It's not, it's not recruitment. What keeps me uh, awake at night is some uh, public event which uh, confuses the American pe people seriously about the census. Uh, as I cited in my testimony, a, um, if a hacker brought, brought, broke in, not to the census, but to some other major government file, and suddenly the American people really did believe that government information was, was not protected, that would hurt us seriously if it happened in the next two or three days. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, we learned just yesterday that another mailing, a large mailing, large mass mailing, has the same digit problem uh, as the one that we experienced. And so I woke up this morning shaking that somehow the story would be told that, that the Census Bureau had sold its mailing list, because how else could this mistake happen again? Now clearly that's complete falsehood. But those are the things that make me anxious. A, a, a public story that, that I know to be wrong, but happens at just the wrong moment, and we can't get it fixed. I'm much more frightened of that kind of event, uh, our outcome, and then natural disasters, of course, than I am right now in any of our operations. Our operations are on schedule, on track, on budget. You may not have any information on this, but if you do, I, I am curious about how recruitment compares to 1990 when we had a, a much weaker economy, do you have any comparison as to how recruitment is going now compared to, to when we had uh, more unemployed people? I, I start by reminding um, the committee uh, that with the uh, active support of, of the U.S. Congress, uh, very active, important support of the U.S. Congress, we have front-loaded our recruitment system. That's the huge change from 1990. In 1990, it wasn't that our rates were so bad, it's that you have a high level of attrition, and then you're scrambling to fill those empty positions by allowing us to front load. Uh, bear in mind, we are, we are hiring two people for every one person we need. Now, is that a waste of money? No. If they all come to work and do the job, we just get finished quicker. Uh, we'll still put them to work. But uh, uh, the attrition levels thus far in our early staffing of our office and so forth have been quite modest. They were modest in the dress rehearsal. So I would say that our overall recruitment plan, as well as recruitment rate, uh, is much, much more robust than, than 1990. Uh, I, er, again, every day I say, well, look, it's looking good. We're at 70% or 74%. That doesn't mean that tomorrow it won't go dry. You don't know how deep that well is. But uh, every day we get more calls, as I just said, a million hits to our website uh, just the day before yesterday. So we think there's a large enough pool out there to recruit. If we have to change wage rates in some areas or do some different kinds of, of emergency action, uh, we, will, we will do it. Let me uh, um, ask some more questions on this recruitment issue. Um, as we both know, you know, you know, national numbers tell you one thing, but it's really a very local issue. What happens in Bradenton is not necessarily Florida, my hometown, versus Manhattan. You know, and it, you can't transfer the, uh, the enumerators from Manhattan to Bradenton. Uh, they might want to come to Brain. It's a beautiful area, by the way. You've been there. <laughs> little Chamber of Commerce plug there. Um, the, um, so, w based on news, of the media reports and such um, about different areas, there's articles here in the city of Washington, as I mentioned, and such, and in New York City, uh, what percentage of the 520 offices are having problems? And can you give us a description of, uh, of you know, of what those, you know, is there any common characteristics of ones that are having problems and such? Yep. Sure. As of uh, as of March 1st, uh, no, sorry, March 3rd. So this is fairly recent data. We have a four uh, four four layer classification 
system when we're looking at local recruitment. Um, with green being, we feel good, we're really close to target. Uh, yellow being, we've got to pay a little bit more attention. Orange being, nervous making, and red being, take emergency action. Uh, as of March 3rd, we had five LCOs in our emergency action, that is in our red category. That's, uh, of course, less than 1%. It doesn't make them insignificant. As I say, the, the problem of the census is always that last 5%. But the good thing about those five cases is that they're scattered. It's not like they're all in Atlanta or all in um, New York. They're scattered. In fact, New York, I think, has none of these uh, uh, five. Um, one or two of the five are much less of a problem than what they appear to be. For example, one of them is the LCO in the um, near north side of Chicago. Now, that LCO covers an area which is actually going to have a higher response rate than the city of Chicago. But it's, it, it's targeted to have the same response rate as the rest of the city because we didn't break them out uh, anything like that level of detail. So even though it, it appears in red, we don't believe it is a red, uh, but we're treating it as one nevertheless. Then there are about 17 percent, well, let me say altogether, um, about 30 percent of our um, are in the yellow-orange category, where we do believe we have to take exceptional action. And that includes everything from uh, sending out expertise to doing more advertising and so forth. Now, these numbers fl every week, you know, some move up and some move down because that target is, is still climbing. So you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, you can get a big national picture that looks very good. 74%, we only want to have, we only need 70% at this stage, but there's variation around that, uh, and you've got a tail. Uh, you've got a small number of cases which are problems, uh, and some of those get picked up in the press, some of them incorrectly, by the way, I have to say. Sometimes the press is being uh, used by our local recruitment people to tell a more uh, frightening story than actually exists in our numbers. Uh, in order to generate uh, a public response. Uh, we found two or three cases of that. We weren't particularly happy about it, but nevertheless, we understood from the local level why, why they did it. Um, and I don't mean, again, to paint a rosy picture, but of the things that worry me right now, and I would not have known this a month ago. I would not have known a month ago that I could sit here today and say, now that we're into it, 73,000 people are out there distributing the questionnaires. That is, the operation that has to be staffed is staffed. We fully staffed Alaska on schedule. I believe we will fully staff non-response follow-up on schedule. How about these hard-to-count areas? Uh, that uh, the, 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 the staffing is doing okay. The pattern is not exactly. Okay. It's not the, the near north side is not a hard-to-count area. The pattern is not disproportionately in the in the hard-to-count areas. Um, this it, I asked a question about. You mentioned front loading, and uh, it was and this was someone out of an article that uh, when you call some people, this one article was saying that they have to call 10 people on the approved list before they get one, they only get one out of 10. And the question is the shelf life of this applicant pool. Explain to me, you know, the process. I mean, I, I've heard this, people, you know, take the test, they get accepted, but you really don't need them. They may not even call them for two months, and by then, they don't know. And I mean, how are we keeping in touch with these people to make sure they, they know they're in the pool and such? Surely, no, it's, it's, that's, it's a serious problem, as a matter of fact. Uh, we think of this recruitment pool the same way you might think of a, of a, of a military draft. You know, you, you, you draft everyone, but you don't call everyone. But in order, when you're going to war, you don't know for sure how many you're going to need and when you're going to need them. So you want that pool of draftees in place. Well, what you've done is created a very large pool of draftees, in effect. Now, it certainly goes stale. We do make calls. People say, no, I've already taken a different job and so forth. So our, our, our expected ratio is only one out of, you know, one out of five. That is, uh, we want a recruitment pool of, um, in fact, even less than one out of five, one out of six, a recruitment pool of 2.4 million for about a half a million uh, jobs, so roughly a, a five to one ratio. So that's a pretty high ratio, as a matter of fact. I mean, there's got to be an awful lot of decay of that pool before we get down to having none or having fewer than 500,000. The, 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 I saw that same uh, uh, story, as a matter of fact, one of ten. That really did surprise me. That's, that's certainly, that doesn't mean it did not happen, but that's not a pattern, that, that we're only getting one out of ten of our calls and we actually call people. The other issue you, addr you address uh, is the issue of, of keeping in touch with them. We don't. It's simply, it's, it would just be uh, prohibitively expensive to sort of always be writing them and say, are you still available, are you still available? Then they get angry at us because we haven't called them. Uh, there are, there are unhappy people out there who say, I took the test, I passed it. They say they want jobs, they continue to advertise, yet they don't call me. We explain that when people take the test. I have the materials here that says exactly what we say to them, but not everyone internalizes that. And then they read the ad and they say, why don't they call me? 
Uh, and that's, that, is a, that is an issue, but there's not much we can do about it. What we need to have them there is on April 19th. We needed them on March 3rd, well, March 1st, to do the training. They were there. We'll need them on March 19th when we start non-response follow-up. As we get closer to non-response follow-up, going to the response rate issue, if the response rate is at our 61 target, we're going to need all half a million of them. We will start earlier than the 19th getting out some kind of, of reminder system to make sure that they're going to be there when we're we going through training now is that no the update leave people went through update leave people yes, went through training right. so how old would some of these people that took the test i mean does it go back to last year or is it only so, well the testing really didn't much start until january so that some may have taken the test in january and got yeah. approved in january That's right. maybe and then maybe six months before we called okay them. so they could be as much as six months yeah now uh, a lot of the people who did the early testing, of course, were people who were brought in in, in our office work, and, and we did staff up our offices, uh, and of course then update leave, but only in those areas. So no, there are people who took the test as long as, will have taken the test as long as six months before they're called. But we would not want to write them and say, we don't think we're going to need you, because we won't know that. See, go back to your other point. You're talking about uh, uh, response rates which themselves are highly variable. You know, you're going to be 85 percent some places and 45 percent other places. Um, so we can't take, and we don't know for sure what those places are going to be, so we can't take a chance on telling someone we don't know them until we know for sure where they're going to need to be. Finally, on your question of moving people from New York to Bradenton, um, as you well know, we very much want to recruit from and use in the local community. As a last resort, uh, we probably wouldn't move that far. <laughs> but as a last resort, we would have to dip into our pool where we had a higher, um, a deeper pool to move into areas where we had a shallower pool and pay the transportation cost. We would still take care, of course, to match up the cultural, linguistic, racial characteristics and so forth as best we could. Um, I have a couple more questions, but if you want to go first and then Maloney. Sure. The, the, the 90s plus 5 program you outlined in your, your testimony sounds like a, a very good idea, a creative way of of getting uh, communities across the country involved in, in boosting their response rates. And, and do you have any idea uh, how much money you could save if the program goals are met? Could you just elaborate a little more on the 90s plus 5 program, another accomplishment, I would say? Well, uh, we obviously are very excited about that program for two reasons, one of which is it does have real operational and cost-saving implications. But also, it's a, it's a rallying cry, uh, uh, and I've been very, very pleased by the level of adoption by mayors and governors around the country. It's really a rallying cry, the, the census as a, a civic event, um, and it's working that way. Um, I'm going off tonight, as a matter of fact, uh, and I'll be making, I think, as many as six or seven different stops in Virginia and North Carolina. Each one of those is built around the 90 plus 5 notion. Uh, with mayors and uh, complete count committees and other kinds of promotional uh, settings. Um, if it were successful, that is, if we actually added 5% to 1990, that's a 70% response rate. That is a 9% increase from our current target. Now, you've heard the number before of each percentage point is maybe as much as, as 25 million. That's a hard number because it's not exactly linear, but that's an order of magnitude. So if we actually were to, um, were to have that, that successful, we would save many multiple millions of dollars for the taxpayer if we could actually increase the response rate to 70%. It would also be good for the country along other dimensions, of course, not just the money-saving dimension. The Bureau conducted a, a foresight test, full-load test of the data capture system during the week of February 22nd. And the system was supposedly to be fully operational as of March 6, 2000 last Monday. Would you describe the test for us? What was involved? What sorts of equipment were tested? What type of personnel were engaged? What is full load? Yeah. What, what that test does is bring up all four of our data capture sites and test them as if they were now pumping the, process, the material through at the rate at which we will have to pump it through uh, during the data capture period itself. It is uh, our final major uh, test of the data capture system. Uh, which is we know is highly uh, highly technical system uh, has to data capture a lot of uh, you know m forms that get wrinkled smudge marks uh, all the kinds of things that can make it difficult to capture those uh, those data um, and I can only say that it, that it, it all tested out just exactly the way we expected it to um, uh, early on in uh, an earlier test in uh, Pomona I believe it was uh, our, our capture rate was and our productivity rate was less than what we wanted it to be. 
we retested that then in later in Phoenix and it moved up to that level. And then we retested in our in our foresight test uh, the entire system simultaneously, and uh, it we're very it's right now. I, again, I keep wanting to go back. It doesn't mean you know, that tomorrow morning we won't learn something. But as of right now, uh, the data capture system is functioning. We're we're now we're now capturing data. Uh, we're we're recording stuff as it's coming in. We're we're. Uh, as I said, we had 500 forms already accepted over the telephone um, just in the first couple of days. We, um, uh, people are filing by internet. Uh, I don't have a number on that, but it, it, it certainly is working. I used it myself. Uh, so the systems are functioning. Both the chairman and I are, are very supportive of census in the schools. In fact, we even introduced a resolution supporting it in a bipartisan joint way. Could you give us a, a little more detail on how the program is working, how many schools and teachers are involved, and what percentage of the students do you estimate have been reached and will be reaching their parents, and have the materials been delivered, um, has Scholastic performed well on their contract, and um, can you just give us an overview of it? And Surely. Um, just quickly on the on the uh, Scholastic as the subcontractor on that thing, um, uh, they they perform very very well in terms of we thought in terms of curricular um, uh, the construction of the curriculum, uh, the imaginative design and so forth. Uh, there was a period where we were experiencing severe backlogs in getting the materials to the school. Uh, we are now past that backlog completely. Uh, we're now got a lag time of only about three days before an order comes in and the and the kit goes out. Uh, I think that the number of kits now out are 1.5 million. Uh, that's a huge number of schools. Uh, the, uh, the chairman and I did a census, a really quite, <laughs> quite attractive census in the schools uh, event in his district. Uh, very sophisticated kids. I must have done, oh, 15 or 20 of them already, uh, about half of them with members of Congress. They, for me, they've been some of the highlights of the, of the census period. Um, I, I think it is going to be one of the most important things. Look, the, the kids are really great ambassadors for the census. And uh, if they go home with this message, uh, then we're going to get a higher response rate. And especially, we, as you know, we targeted the hard-to-count areas. Uh, we're 100% in all of those areas. We're obviously not 100% across the entire country, but we are 100% in the hard-to-count areas, uh, which is roughly 40% of the schools is how we calculated that. So we're, uh, we're feeling very good about that program. Well, my time is up. Okay. Uh, mentioned since in schools, I did another one recently in Venice, Florida, an elementary school, and I had all the, I think, third, fourth, and fifth grades come into the cafeteria, and they brought a pencil, and so I talked, and we had the map, like, you know, the, that you make available, and um, I had two questions that, uh, that I had to help the students with, and in particular, makes me think about, because you had a list, who else is in your household? And the one young boy said, do I count my dog? I can answer that one. The other one was more difficult. It was, and this is the type of questions you have is, um, he li this child lives with a mother three days a week and father four days a week, and the next week is just reversed. Well, who do I get counted with? I mean, those are some yeah, of the, yeah. you know, the mother and father may not talk well enough. I mean, so th there's a lot of challenges that are, you know, yes. that you, you are very aware of, but it just <laughs> came up uh, uh, in that particular hearing. Um, Ms. Lunch brought up the data capture system. I know GAO considers that some one of the great concerns right now. Um, and, you know, they'll be testifying again next week, so I don't know their latest, you know, feeling on it. Uh, I, when the test was run here in February, was it did it was it was it the entire system from when the forms come out of the bot, out of the trucks and loaded up and all the way through it, and um, uh, you know, but you're comfortable that the data capture system is going to work. I think hopefully Ms. Maloney and I can make a trip to one of them during the peak of it and uh, get a chance to see it in operation because it has to be amazing to see that volume of operation. Could I just take an extra two minutes and ask? Uh, John Thompson uh, to, to say a word. He's much more familiar okay. with that test than I am. Yes, Thompson. Uh, what we did was we ran um, about 2.2 million forms per day through our scanners, and then we processed them through the remainder of the process, uh, including transmission of the capture data to headquarters simultaneously to make sure that all sites worked. That was the workload. Actually, the million, the million forms per day to headquarters is a workload that we anticipate we have to meet for Census 2000 processing. And the test went, went very well. The one thing we didn't test was the sorters. We didn't put the questionnaires back into envelopes, but we've tested the sorters extensively, and we tested them also in, in uh, we used them in 1990, so the sorters haven't changed very much. 
How about the, 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 the different handwriting and such? Is that yes? We 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 tested a okay. variety of different handwritings to make sure that uh, the optical character recognition could catch it, including a variety of different um, uh, multiple race responses. Um, since there's C-SPAN and another uh, covering this, I might want to make sure that you get introduced. You've been sitting behind Dr. Pruitt for the past several years uh, at TestFi, but you are the one with the direct responsibility and had the task, and you've been in charge of this since when were you first appointed to this position? Um, I, I think, I believe I was appointed in 1998 to the position I'm currently in. Okay, 1998. Well, you, you know, tough job. I've been working on the census, though, since uh, right, you're a career. 1980. Right, you've been, you've been with the Bureau for a long time, so thank you. And I'm, I'm glad, I think this may be your first time actually to talk to the <laughs> committee. Thank you very much. It's a tough job, and you do, do a fine job there. Let me ask, I have one more question, and it came up in your comments, and I mentioned it too in the Salvation Army, uh, the access to facilities serving special populations such as the Salvation Army. How much of a problem that is that? Is there anything we could do to help move this along? Oh, I, I appreciate that offer, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. No, I've actually been in, in very close touch with the highest um, um, lieutenant Colonel, I believe he's called, um, of the Salvation Army. It's, it's an understandable uh, reluctance. Their judgment is that when people are eating, that this is something which is kind of private. It's not a confidentiality issue. It's a privacy issue. And they are uh, concerned that if the people who are actually sitting in the uh, dining halls and having their meals are being enumerated, that that will uh, uh, create a, a, a deterrent for them to come in and get the meal. Uh, the Salvation Army has been completely cooperative with respect to counting all of their residents, all the people who sleep there. But it's just this one issue of the people actually while they're eating their meal. And so what we have worked out with the Salvation Army is that these people do queue, they do get in a line before they come into the dining hall or to the soup kitchen, and that we will be able to count during that period. I should remind you that the um, primary uh, count of the uh, people without conventional housing, as we say, or the homeless, uh, is based upon where they sleep, not where they eat. Where they eat is only a, uh, uh, an extra safety net in case we miss some people who don't use any shelters. If the people are sheltered, we think we'll get them in the shelters. So these are really the people who don't go to shelters but do come in and get meals. Uh, we're still trying to count the people who are, you know, sleeping in the park or sleeping on the beach, uh, but we fear we won't get all of them. So this is an extra, extra step. Indeed, we have to ask the people who are counting as they get the meal, have you already spent a night in a shelter? Because if they have, then we would not be including them in the count. So it's a very small problem, uh, and we think we'll solve it. Let me thank you for your assurance a few minutes ago that, you know, you're going to, as far as close on, you're going to stay in the field as long as necessary to get the best possible count. I mean, I'm, I appreciate your public assurance of that. Ms. Loney, any final questions? Or? No, I've, I've uh, enjoyed this. I look forward to the GAO reporting and, and again would like to request that the chairman call the monitoring board, both sides, to come and report right. to us. I think that's an, a legitimate uh, oversight of our body, too, <coughs> to look into what the monitoring board is uh, doing. I think we have a hearing tentatively scheduled for the issue of uh, this access. This is a serious, whether it's real or perceived, it is certainly perceived and uh, I think we need to get to the bottom of it. Sometimes it could be procedures within the, your uh, agency. Maybe they will understand better. I think it's better that we're, we're not present. I think uh, I see uh, Mr. Fred Asbell, who's with the, at least on the, the congressional side of the monitoring board here. I think Chris Mim was here earlier. Certainly, I don't know if he still is. There he is there. Uh, and I, I'm not, so, you know, I know y'all don't have your calendar, so you can't do it today, but I almost like to say pin y'all down. But if y'all could get it put together as quickly as possible, I, I like that it's behind us. I just think Hey, we're getting some critical stages, of, as, as you know, going into the summer, and we don't want to do anything to interrupt or interfere with the uh, census, but we do have a, uh, a responsibility uh, uh, to make sure that, um, that we know everything we can. And a lot of it is gearing up for how do you do ACE. I mean, some of that time, sometimes this information um, uh, is, is needed. So um, I thank you for being here today. Um, uh, on behalf of the subcommittee, I'd like to thank you for appearing before us today. I ask unanimous consent that all members of witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. In case there are any additional questions that members may have for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks for members to submit questions for the record and that witnesses submit written answers as soon as practicable. I would also like to submit uh, the Census Monitoring Board's Congressional Members' request for oversight materials mentioned in my um, opening statement for the record. I'm also submitting the observation guidelines issued by the Census Bureau for the record also. And Ms. Maloney, you had something I think that should be included in the mm -hmm. record without objection, so ordered. 
thank you again, and I'll see you at the uh, appropriations hearing in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>